Hi, thank you all so much for coming along to join me this morning. I am here to talk about interactional rapport and the differences in rapport between autistic and neurotypical people. This is a piece of experimental research which is part of a larger project um, designed to explore autistic social behaviours. With this project, we were interested in whether for an autistic person, interaction was different depending on whether they were also interacting with another autistic person or with someone who was neurotypical. So a quick rundown of the structure of what I'll be speaking about this morning. Firstly, I'll tell you what we mean by rapport and how we measure it. I'll explain what we're comparing and why. I'll talk you through the two experimental studies we've just completed on interactional rapport and finish by talking about what we think this means for how we understand social interaction and autism. So firstly, what do we mean by rapport? Rapport is defined as having a good understanding of someone and an ability to communicate with them well. Rapport is associated with feelings of ease, comfort and synchrony in a social interaction. And we were interested in measuring two types of rapport. We were firstly interested in the rapport that people feel during an interaction with another person. So we called this self-rated rapport. And when we talk about self-rated rapport, this is when someone has been directly involved in an interaction with another person, and then afterwards we ask what that experience was like for them. We were also interested in the rapport that observers outside the social interaction pick up on. We call this observer-rated rapport, and this means that we ask people to watch interactions and then rate how well they thought the two people in the interaction were getting on and to rate their rapport with one another. We wanted to compare self and observer rated rapport in pairs of autistic people with pairs of neurotypical people and with pairs where one person was autistic and the other person was neurotypical. So why did we want to do this? Why were we interested in this? We know that autistic people can have difficulties in social interaction. The diagnostic criteria for autism include persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across multiple contexts. We also know that autism is a really heterogeneous thing. It's a spectrum and different autistic people will have different patterns of strengths and of difficulties. We might expect, therefore, that a couple of autistic people interacting together who both struggle with social communication and who both struggle to understand other people might have particular difficulties. We might expect that their interaction will quick, quickly break down and that they will have low rapport. We might expect that given that non-autistic people have better social cognition, that they would be a better social partner for autistic people because they will be able to use their better social skills to help scaffold that interaction and understand their partner better, and that this would lead to higher rapport. However, we do have many first-person accounts from autistic people saying that interacting with other autistic people is easier and more comfortable and less stressful than interacting with neurotypical people. So given this contrast between the clinical definition of autism and the experiences that we've been hearing about from some autistic people, we wanted to find out whether there were measurable differences in rapport when autistic people were interacting with other autistic people and with neurotypical people. And we did two studies to explore this, the first looking at self-rated rapport and the second at observer-rated rapport. So, study one. I'll talk about this one first. We recruited 72 participants for this study, half were autistic and half were neurotypical. We split them into three groups and then into pairs within these groups. So we had a pair where autistic people would be paired with other autistic people. We had a group where neurotypical people would be paired with other neurotypical people. And we had a group where autistic and neurotypical people were paired together. Nobody within these pairs knew each other before the study started. And these participants were asked to complete three different tasks with their partner with a short break in between each task. 
These were collaborative social tasks that each lasted around five minutes and they involved things like building a tower out of spaghetti and plasticine and making a shape out of a twisting toy. So there was a lot of space for people to chat and get to know each other and build rapport. After completing each task, we asked participants to rate how they thought the interaction had gone and how they felt. So to measure self-rated rapport, we used a bespoke measure that we designed in collaboration with autistic people, which featured five questions about each interaction. These were, how much did you enjoy interacting with this person? How easy did you find interacting with this person? How successful do you think the interaction was between you? How friendly did you find this person? And how awkward did you find the interaction? After each question, participants were given a 100-point scale like this one here. So there's a line with zero at one end and 100 at the other. And they were asked to put an X on the line, indicating how they felt about each of the questions. Uh, now, as we would expect, these five domains were very closely linked with one another, and the scores had a high Cronbach's alpha. And so subsequent analysis just summed them to become a single scale of self-rated interactional rapport. Here's a very quick description of the participants in the study in the autistic, neurotypical, and mixed groups. So this table here is showing the mean and standard deviations. The average age of our participants was mid-30s. We had more women than men. And the years of education and IQ were fairly high. Each of the three groups were matched on gender, age, years of education, and IQ. And as we would expect, our autistic participants showed significantly higher levels of autistic traits as measured by the AQ than our neurotypical participants. And here are the results from the study. So what we have in this graph here are the self-rated rapport measures for the mixed pairs in yellow, um, the autistic pairs in green, and the neurotypical pairs in blue. And what this shows is that when, when neurotypical people are with uh, other neurotypical people, they have high rapport. So that's the blue box over on the right. When autistic people are with other autistic people, they also have high rapport. So that's the green box. Autistic people's experience of rapport with other autistic people isn't significantly different to how neurotypical people experience rapport with other neurotypical people. In contrast, this yellow box on the left here shows the rapport for the mixed pairs, and their rapport is significantly lower. So pairs of autistic people and pairs of neurotypical people don't significantly differ in their rapport when they are with someone of the same neurotype as them, but when we have these mixed pairs where one person is autistic and one person is neurotypical, they experience much lower interactional rapport. So given that the rapport in the mixed pairs was so much lower, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into this. We wanted to find out whether this drop in rapport was because autistic people are having low rapport with neurotypical people, whether neurotypical people are having low rapport with autistic people, or whether it was a bit of both. So we split the mixed group apart to tease these results uh, apart a little bit more. So what we can see in this graph is in green, we have the rapport for autistic people with other autistic people. And the light yellow box to the right of that is autistic people with neurotypical people, so when they are in a mixed pair. We can see here that there is a pretty huge difference in rapport. This is a big, significant difference. In blue, we have the rapport for neurotypical people with other neurotypical people. And in the yellow to the right of that, we have neurotypical people with autistic people. There's less of a difference there. It's statistically non-significant. And what we think this means is that autistic people perceive strong differences in rapport depending on the diagnosis of the person that they're interacting with. Autistic people are capable of having much higher rapport if they are interacting with someone who is autistic, and rapport is reduced when they are interacting with someone neurotypical. For neurotypical people, it's not a very clear picture as the results are kind of on the cusp of significance, um, but what we can see here is that the impact definitely seems greater for autistic people. So on to study two, where we looked at observer-rated rapport. To look at observer-rated rapport, we created a set of videos, each with a different pair of people in them. We made nine videos in total, each with a different pair, and each about five minutes long. Three had a pair of autistic people in them, three had a pair of neurotypical people in them, and three had a pair where one person was autistic and the other was neurotypical. 
Each of the people in the pair didn't know each other in advance of making the video. And in the video, they had to ask each other some basic questions. So it was things like, uh, can you tell me about your journey here today? Can you tell me what you're doing next weekend? And can you tell me about the area that you live in? So it was fairly standard stuff just to get a bit of back and forth between the two people in the video. And then with these videos, we got other participants to rate them. We have a sample size of 79 for this study. So we have 30 autistic raters and 39 neurotypical raters. And these raters were blind to the diagnosis of the people in the videos. So they didn't know whether the people having these interactions were autistic or not. So our raters watch the video and they score the interaction between the two people in the video using the same rapport questions that I described earlier. So how, er uh, how easy, enjoyable, friendly, successful and awkward they thought that the interactions were. Once again, these five measures of interactional rapport had a high Cronbach alpha and so were summed to create a single measure of interactional rapport for the subsequent analysis. We also asked raters whether they thought that anyone in the video was autistic, and if so, who? So this is just to quickly introduce the rater participants from study two. Uh, they were matched on age, gender, years of education. Um, again, the average age was mid-30s with slightly more women than men and a fairly high years of education. So here are the initial results from study two. This is the data from all of the raters, autistic and neurotypical, collapsed together into one graph. So we have the raters for the autistic pairs in green, the mixed pairs in yellow, and the neurotypical pairs in blue. And what we can see from this is that pairs of autistic people have the highest level of observer-rated rapport. That means that when watching videos of two autistic people interacting, Observers who do not know their diagnosis think that these people get on best. Neurotypical pairs have the same, uh, ha, sorry, have the next highest uh, rate of observer-rated rapport, and mixed pairs have the lowest uh, levels of observer-rated rapport. Here are the results split by whether the rater was neurotypical or autistic. We have the neurotypical uh, raters on the left and the autistic raters on the right. So the same pattern exists in these data as in the overall data set, where we see autistic pairs being perceived as having the highest, the best rapport, followed by neurotypical pairs, and then finally, the mixed pairs have the lowest rapport. However, the differences between the three sets aren't all significant in the same pattern as in the overall data set. We do have a, an important consistent finding that autistic pairs are always rated as having significantly better rapport than mixed pairs. There are a couple of interpretations that we've had for these findings. Here's how we've read them for the moment, but if you have any other ideas of how we could read them, please do come and talk to me later on today or tomorrow. So firstly, it could be that autistic pairs and neurotypical pairs do not significantly differ in their observer-rated interactional rapport. It could also be that there's a lack of power to detect the difference now that we've split the sample in half by uh, grouping into autistic and neurotypical raters. Secondly, it could be that only autistic people perceive differences between mixed and neurotypical pairs, and that neurotypical pairs do not pick up on this. This may mean that autistic people are more skilled at reading autistic discomfort in a mixed pair, and that's why we're seeing the significant difference between the mixed pairs and both the autistic and neurotypical pairs by the autistic raters. As well as asking raters to judge the interactional rapport of the pairs, we also asked whether they thought anyone in the video was autistic or not. We wanted to find out whether people were more likely to think that someone was autistic when they were with another autistic person, or when they were with a neurotypical person, or whether that didn't matter. Raters gave yes-no responses to this question after watching the video. And this is what we found. So what we have here is the percentage of raters that correctly guessed that one or both of the people in the video was autistic. In the green, we have the percentage correct when it was an autistic pair, so when we had two autistic people together. And in the blue, we have the percentage correct for a mixed pair, so when an autistic person was with a neurotypical person. The first two columns on the left are the data from all of the raters put together. 
So as we can see, people are much less likely to guess that someone is autistic when they are with another autistic person. When we have two autistic people together, people only correctly guess 32% of the time that one of them is autistic. However, when we have an autistic person with a neurotypical person, this jumps to 81% of the time. So when we have these mixed pairs, it's much more obvious to observers that someone is autistic. On the right, we can see that this pattern is consistent across both autistic and neurotypical raters. So, what does all this mean? Study one has shown us that autistic people uh, feel comfortable and have high rapport interactions with other autistic people, um, as neurotypical people do with other neurotypical people. They don't significantly differ on their self-rated rapport. However, when we have autistic and neurotypical people together, that self-rated rapport is significantly lower. Study two shows us that this rapport goes beyond just an internal feeling, and that external ob observers can pick up on this rapport. Again, what we seem to see here is that autistic and neurotypical pairs are judged to have good rapport and mixed pairs are judged to have lower rapport. A secondary finding is that observers are much more likely to think that someone is autistic when they're with a neurotypical person, but when two autistic people are together and interacting with high rapport, raters don't seem to think they're autistic. Looking at interaction rapport has been a really interesting thing to be able to do and to explore empirically for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it lends some nice empirical data to the autistic community who are often telling us that they find spending time with other autistic people very valuable and important. Secondly, it shows that problems with social interaction may be more likely to occur when an autistic person is interacting with a neurotypical person. And so we need to think about what neurotypical people need to be doing to help support bridging that gap rather than expecting autistic people to constantly adapt their communication style. Thirdly, it shows us that we need to think about what this means for how we conceptualize autism. If it's potentially less detectable when two autistic people are together, what can we learn from this? So I'd like to finish with a huge thank you to our team, uh, including Sue, Danny, Emma, Martha, and Harriet, um, our funders, the Templeton World Charity Foundation. A huge thank you to all of our participants that came in to take part in this research, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Catherine. Um, um, that's the, your time up, so we're going to move on to the next presentation without questions.